Hi, my name's Phil. I like to talk about politics. In this video, I'd like to discuss uh, some of the latest breathtaking examples of trade friction and experienced by businesses in Britain and, you know, who are increasingly despairing of government that seems to have no answers and only claims that things are getting better when actually they're getting worse and wonder if we should really just join a customs union with the EU. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So first of all, I regret to inform you that our dogs, the Puggles, are now a Brexit casualty. I went to pets at home to get their little low calorie doggy ice cream treats. None in, none in. Went online to try and find out what's going on. Inevitably, should have guessed, shouldn't I? Should have guessed. We import them into the country and they're not, they're not produced here. And the company that ships them across is unable to supply UK customers at this time. Poor little doggles. But anyway, never mind. Grant Shapps, cabinet minister, said this week that trading goods between the UK and the EU is almost back to normal. It is, of course, nothing of the sort. He tried to claim this on the basis that he said the number of lorries now passing between the UK and France was up to about 6,000 a day. Now, I do not know whether or not that is true. Uh, that's still about 17% down on the same point as last year. But what I do know is that the lorries passing from the UK to France is not a measure of trade. It matters what's in them. It has already been reported that more than double the normal amount of lorries are actually empty. About 65% of them are empty, which is normally about 30% as compared to before Brexit. In addition, as I talked about recently, given that you can have lorries passing across without any goods in them, what about the ones who are carrying some goods? Are they carrying on average as much as they were before? If we've got over double the number of lorries just empty, or the proportion of lorries just empty, I'm gonna guess the average amount carried on lorries in terms of value is also less. The other thing to bear in mind as well, it's all right having a lorry go from the UK to France. If it then gets stopped in France and the paperwork's not right, and that's the case in, as far as I know, it may, it was a couple of weeks ago, 90% of cases the paperwork was wrong when it got to France, then the goods have been seen, they're not getting into the EU. So it's still hitting trade. We know that trade hasn't just taken a few weeks to get back to normal because business groups are positively screaming at the government to do something. Just this week, we've had business leaders writing to Michael Gove to demand something be done. You know, businesses in different parts of our economy are certainly not thinking that their business is getting back to normal. So this is all just part of the government's attempts to calm the general population down who wouldn't necessarily know the difference. After all, official figures on trade will not become available until late next year. You have to have the whole year happen and then data has to be collected and collated and analysed and processed before we can get hold of it. You know, in addition, as I said in my earlier video, we are enjoying grace periods on a number of Brexit impacts. Brexit has been phased in over a period of time with more of it coming online from April and then more still from July and, and down the line. And let me be clear about what we mean by the ending of grace periods. It means that some goods will no longer be able to be traded at all, that currently can be, and others that can be traded will need additional paperwork. Oh yeah, imagine, imagine the poor trader getting to grips with their new forms. They've bought a whole box of brand new black pens only to be handed another box of entirely new forms to be filled in as well. This week, the Welsh Affairs Committee uh, was taking evidence on how Brexit trade friction was relating to businesses in or with Wales. The general issues, of course, will apply around Britain. Um, the example, that, the couple of examples that caught my eye, um, and I think some others, but these are ones that's like, just for the slightest little thing now, you can have your whole, whole cargo knackered. So one was a £100,000 consignment worth of meat that was just wiped out, blocked, couldn't, be got, couldn't pass into the EU because one carcass fell off a hook in the lorry. There were some rookie errors as well. 
like filling in the paperwork in blue ink instead of black. Hence my comment there about the new black pens. I'll be on, even I knew that growing up. You fill in a form with black ink, you know that. You should know that. I'm not a trader, you know that. So I have a little bit less sympathy there. But at the same time, it does just show you how little room for error. In the early, you know, in the early days, we're still in the early days. But I remember someone who was having to transport live lobsters or something. And theirs got held up for some time because when they put in where it come from, they put UK instead of GB. And of course, it matters because there is no UK market and no such thing. From the point of view of trading with the EU, UK is irrelevant because there's a difference between coming from Northern Ireland and coming from Great Britain. And... Um, but it just shows you just these small things will cause holdups and potentially block the whole thing if it's not rectified. If it's not rectified. Because if you won't accept a form filled in blue ink, you're, you're filling it all out in black ink. And it's more than one form as well. It's dozens of forms. Because um, it can't be said enough. We, we have a very weak trade agreement with the EU. It represents just one step up from no deal at all. There seem to be people who think because it's billed as this free trade agreement that it's all the bells and whistles. Oh, free trade agreement. They're, they're the ones. The free trade agreements are brilliant. No, no, no. It, it does hardly anything for our trade with such a huge market on our doorstep. You can look at examples like this and you wonder, you know, if it's all really that necessary, you know, blue ink, really, a carcass fell on the floor, what? Uh, after all, it didn't seem to be a problem when we were in the single market. But of course, therein lies the issue. Single market. In the single market, we were bound by single market rules. Now that we're not, the EU need to be able to check that the goods coming into their market match their standards. They need to know that we're maintaining those standards, you know, at least for the goods entering their market. They don't care about the rest. Um, I mean, we can do what we like with the others. But just the act of checking, even if everything is fine, requires a huge paper trail which needs to be checked, well, it needs to be filled in, first of all, then it needs to be checked, verified, audited, all takes time and expense. Then there are those World Trade Organization rules that Brexiteers have wet dreams over. Frictionless trade across, across a border requires an international treaty. We'd call it a customs union. We don't have a customs union. What we have is a free trade agreement. What's the difference? A free trade agreement can mean zero tariffs, doesn't have to, could just mean mostly zero tariffs, on goods traded between the two parties, you know, with agreement on tariffs for like countries outside the agreement and so on. But it also means bureaucracy, which is needed to track it all. It's like, yeah, you can, you can trade tariff free, but you've got to have a massive paper trail. Whereas if you have a customs union, then that's, that's got all the benefits of a free trade agreement, removes tariffs and so on, but it can also remove the bureaucracy. Sliding scale doesn't have to remove all of it, you know. But a customs union, really, when people talk about a free trade agreement as being the aim, they really should be talking about a customs union when it's talking about, you know, your neighbours at the very least. It doesn't make sense to have a customs union with America. Although, you know, even then there are, there are some more comprehensive than others, as I say, um, which means more useful than others. So we used to have the best of all whilst we were still in the single market. Even as non... even when we weren't EU members like last year, we still were in the customs union. Um, you know, there can, there'll still be customs declaration needed. Like as one trader was putting it, they, they, you, because you still had to fill it in, they used to need to fill in two pieces of documentation. Now they need 41. You can imagine the extra costs and time that are now required to send something across the Brexit border. This is why my pugs don't have any ice cream at the moment. And the reason that the Turkey-EU border, for example, has holdups, because that's notorious, you know, the delays there can be quite horrendous. But Turkey is in a customs union with the EU. Could be a way, way worse. But the thing is that their customs union doesn't cover transport services, for example. So really what we want is a customs union with the EU, not just a free trade agreement, a customs union, a stronger one than Turkey has, preferably one as strong as we used to have, if they want to come up with something that's more bespoke, that does exactly the same as the old one, but they call it something else, you know, EU Customs Union plus plus, I don't care. Um, but that, of course, is not the government's plan. There are some who are looking at the talk of ramping up threats to renege on the withdrawal agreement again, again, as I was talking about earlier, and wondering if their aim 
uh, you know, if they're aiming to try and sneak back into the single market without a customs union, is that what it's all about? Trying to sneak their way back into single market, but without getting into a customs union. It's not readily apparent to me how they achieve this. I mean, how, how would that even be legally possible? But then I'm not an expert in these matters. I shouldn't be surprised that the government would try and do it. After all, some ministers may well be oblivious to the fact that we're actually in a much weaker position than last year. Last year, all of the fears of Brexit were treated as conjecture by those who didn't want to pay attention. Well, now they're reality. British businesses are suffering badly. Brexiteers are furious. I've never seen them so angry. It's quite, it's quite bizarre. You know, Brexiteers have, every time they seem to have won something, seem to get angrier and angrier. They were pretty furious when we left the EU. Mostly because people like me wouldn't accept that it's a good thing. And then when we properly left the EU, we left the customs union single market absolutely livid now. Absolutely livid. And, and you know, so Brexit is now reality. British businesses are suffering very badly. Northern Ireland particularly badly. Um, other businesses around Europe are too, I suppose. But I don't see a daily diet of economic woe in the news media of continental Europe. They seem to be much more preoccupied with COVID and maybe Russia. It's only our media that's lurching from one self-made disaster to another. I really can't understand how our government would imagine that they are somehow in a stronger position to start demanding that the EU do us any more favours just because they made a balls up of something a week ago that they immediately rectified and before any real harm was done. And the likes of Michael Gove thinking that he'll get what he wants with more threats against a trading giant that still hasn't ratified our trade agreement. You know, they could also choose to be finicky, extra finicky with customs checks. You think they're having a, making a bit of a fuss about a carcass on the floor? They could, be, they could be extra careful about their checks if they wanted to be. And they could decide not to grant our service sector any significant level of equivalence. That decision is yet to be made. I mean, it's one of these situations where we need the EU to, we need a close relationship with the moment of the EU. The EU gets to decide a few things over the next few months that are gonna be of material benefit or harm to our economy. We're in a very precarious position. And, and I'm once again in the position as I was last year, and indeed the year before, of not entirely knowing whether the senior players in our government are just mad or just pretending to be mad. Do they realise we're in a lot of trouble and are just making a lot of noise to distract the Brexit nutters from what may turn out to actually be moves towards sensible customs arrangements with the EU? Or are they genuinely thinking that they have some sort of advantage to play over the EU just because they dropped a bollock a week ago? Which, by the way, only seems to be continued newsworthiness in Britain, maybe Ireland as well. Again, not really playing out in any great shape, as far as I can tell, in the EU, the wider EU. As they say, I fear to look, yet I cannot turn away. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.